I'm Carol Off in Kiev, Ukraine for CBC News Correspondent. It was one of the most extraordinary events since the breakup of the Soviet Union. More than a million people flooded into this square, the Maidan. They declared that the presidential elections of last November had been stolen from them. They demanded a new vote, a free and fair one, and they refused to leave the square until they got what they wanted. The crowd seemed to come from nowhere, riding a huge emotional impulse. But was it all so spontaneous? In this program, we'll show you how events were carefully planned and engineered in the back rooms of Kiev, elsewhere in Europe, and as far away as Washington. Here is Anatomy of a Revolution. It looks like the scene of a giant rock concert, but the star is not you too. It's a politician. Viktor Yushchenko, now president of Ukraine. The old Soviet empire was yoked together by violent revolution. There's a new beat now, a different kind of revolution. Not just in Ukraine, but sweeping the former communist East Bloc. Not a single shot. People overwhelmed and really, really removed the government by peaceful means. Ukraine, Georgia, Serbia. Three revolutions, identical in so many ways, fueled by young people fed up with corrupt and criminal governments. When you live 10 years under a regime like Milosevic, you want only one thing to live like uh, uh, normal, common people in Canada. Is there a guiding principle behind them or a guiding hand? If people get together, now nobody, nothing can stop them. Kiev, Ukraine, last July. It seems innocent enough some young people meet for coffee. But in fact, this is tape of a key meeting to plot ways of subverting the Ukrainian government. The campaign is August 23rd. Uh, These are major players in a movement to stage the Orange Revolution. They speak Serbian, Ukrainian, Russian, and English. What are we going to do on August 23rd? They all know one thing, that the Ukrainian ruling elite plans to steal the upcoming presidential election, and these people have to stop them. We have somehow to figure out a way to threaten the heck out of this people, to make them understand that what they do is illegal, and they cannot just simply get away with it. Three months later, the East Ukrainian city of Dnipropetrovsk, just before the presidential election. Vote rigging is a tradition here, but this time the coffee shop revolutionaries will be watching. Vladimir Lenin is also on guard, a reminder that Moscow is still big brother here. Ukraine is independent now, but an older generation feels the bond rallying to support the Moscow-backed candidate, Viktor Yanukovych. They play rap music to attract the city's youth. It's not working. The young people are on the other side of the square, staging their own rally for opposition leader Viktor Yushchenko. 22-year-old Sveta Medvedeva is wary of politics. It isn't difficult to figure out which is the right side of history here, but she thinks it's pointless to vote. Those in the ruling class were campaigning for Yanukovych and forcing this view onto people. They'd come to us and say, Yanukovych is our candidate, and if Yushchenko wins, he's a fascist and everyone will suffer. So what's the point of voting if the election will be falsified and Yanukovych will be the winner no matter what? Suddenly, there were organized rallies and concerts in Dnipropetrovsk and all over Ukraine, telling young people that the election had been stolen and the time had come to fight back. 
She had to join the protests. On TV, she saw the crowds gathering in the streets of Kiev. She heard about something called the Orange Revolution. The fraud had to be stopped, they said. It was time for action. Lenin would not have approved this revolution. Yet for all its Mardi Gras qualities, the amount of organization behind this event would have impressed the old Bolsheviks. Carefully planned, mobilized by a small army of well-trained volunteers with their own security. They blocked off all the streets in the center of town, set up a massive system of tents with its own administration and authority. They kept tight control over the crowds that poured in from all over Ukraine. The idea was to hold the central square of Kiev and to relentlessly pressure the government until it capitulated. Tara Stetskiv inspects life in the tent village. Stetskiv is a member of parliament and the logistics man here. He plans this months in advance arranging for food, 10,000 tents, and giant heaters. But the revolution's success depended on the numbers game. We didn't know how many people would come out. If it's 20,000, this meant we'd lose. If it's 100,000, we still lose. 300,000, we win. But when on the second day, 300,000 came out on the streets of Kiev, on the fourth day, over half a million, and a week later, over a million, even I was shocked and amazed. So how much do you think of the success of that event was spontaneous and how much of it was planned by you? I'm deeply convinced that about 70% of it was preparation. Key to the recruitment of people was media. At first, only the few independent channels, all on cable, actually covered Yushchenko. The most important was TV5 in Kiev with anchor Mykola Verison. The opposition produced an alternative vote count with the help of foreign monitors and exit polls. TV5 broadcast those results. Mykola Verison is now a hero of the revolution. When I realized that the whole square was watching me, and usually millions watch me on TV and here it was just 200,000, but these 200,000 were in one place watching one screen. And that was very moving. The entire time I was reading the news, I was worried I might break down and not be able to finish. The student organization for the Orange Revolution was called Pora, Ukrainian for It's Time. Members were hardcore campus activists, agitating since the year 2000 when an outspoken journalist, Georgi Gongadze, was found dead, beheaded. The intrigue behind the murder implicated then-president Leonid Kuchma. The students only needed an organization. Some wanted violence, but Tara Stetskiv says Pora members were carefully recruited and trained. The key message of the whole camp was the following. We're organizing an act of peaceful, civil disobedience. These three words, peaceful, civil disobedience, were the key. We said to those who came there with the idea of an armed revolution, goodbye. This wasn't about redoing another Bolshevik October revolution, so extremists and radicals were simply kicked out. New York City home to Freedom House, a non-governmental organization that gets most of its money from the U.S. government. Adrian Karatnitsky says they finance training of Pura members. You have a generation of people who feel like they have a right to own their country and have a stake in, in making decisions about it and to influencing it. And so they're pretty cheeky kids who are willing to do things, and one of the ways you lower the threshold of fear is, first of all, the distribution of information. This is where many of the young people learn to lower their threshold of fear. At a Pora training camp last summer in the Crimea, paid for by Freedom House. 
This underground recruitment video looks Club Med, but what they learned here was serious. They were instructed in civil disobedience, how to swell a crowd while keeping it under control, how to deal with police repression, arrests, even beatings. Karatnitsky says the Orange Revolution was the result of a 10-year investment. There was a sophisticated group of people to sustain it, keep it well informed, prevent provocations. All that, I think, was something that was worked out over the course of years. Relentless drumming was amusement during the long days and nights, but it was intended to get on the nerves of the authorities. Here was a generation that had never really known the old Soviet dictatorship, appealing to a generation that had lived in fear of it. Humor and mockery were standard fare of Pura activists, making people laugh at their politicians, undermining the state. These were powerful and effective weapons of civil disobedience, but ones the creaky old dictatorial leaders didn't know how to deal with. On at least one occasion, armed forces were ordered to lock and load their combat weapons. Pura activists kept the crowd heated but peaceful, and the police did nothing to stop them. This street theater makes fun of the candidate Yanukovych, who is a convicted felon. Kievites are entertained. Marko Markovich was one of the people actually hired to train Pura activists. The idea was to disseminate a simple message, that people shouldn't have criminals for politicians, that their vote should count. We also had tactics before the elections that if someone steals your, or your, uh, you, if someone st uh, steals your vote, then tomorrow he will steal your house, your car, your wife, I don't know. He, they will steal all the time from you. So protect, protect your vote and uh, get out on the street. Pora was highly attractive. Thousands came to the square. But it was the young who had the stamina to stay. Among them, Sveta Medvedeva, who came to Kiev to join the revolution. When I entered the square for the first time, to be honest, I just burst into tears. I looked into the eyes of all those people and I saw something that I can't even express with words. I'm proud of my people and that I live in this country. This colorful and clever revolution seemed to have been invented on the spot. It is closely modeled on events that took place four years earlier in another country. Here in Belgrade, Serbia, a group of young upstarts developed a unique brand of revolution and turned it into an export product. If there's anyone close to being the export manager of revolution, it's Serja Popovic. He helps to run a training center for nonviolent resistance in Belgrade. It started in 1998 as a student movement called Otpor, meaning resistance, designed to bring down the government of Slobodan Milosevic. It becomes what we call the, the resistance people movement, uh, finished with more than 40,000 of active people daily in the late 2000. Otpor activists, including Serja Popovich, learned their lessons in non-violent subversion from a number of outside sources. Private U.S. foundations, principally the International Republican Institute, an extension of the Republican Party, paid for the training. When you go on the demonstrations, there are a few things you must learn. First, you must pe keep people busy. Everybody on the demonstrations has its own task. Somebody is running around carrying the water. Somebody is paying attention to your rank. Somebody is in charge for banners. You put the banners in front because you don't want your people to see the enemy. So they can't see. They see their own banners. You don't want to see the ranks of the police ready to beat you. You don't want to hear the sound of the enemy. There is nothing in the world like the sound when they start to use their bats to smash their shields. If nobody who, who whoever, whoever experienced will, will forget it. I know that sound. So we use drums. You use drums to keep your people marching. And of course you, you use very young girls to carry those banners. Because if they beat, that look best on the photos. 
armed with little more than some training and a lot of chutzpah, the Otspor youth hit the streets in 2000, leading up to a presidential election. Dozens of young people were arrested and beaten by police. Street theater, humor, and music were tools. They whistled, they mixed into the crowds, keeping up relentless pressure on the government. Finally, on October 4, 2000, the crowd stormed the parliament. Slobodan Milosevic, as president, was finished. The opposition soon took power. The Serbian Revolution of 2000 had also appeared to be a spontaneous movement, especially the final and violent push. But there was careful coordination. The key ideas and survival rules of the Orange Revolution had come from this event in Serbia. So had many of the funding sources, though the objectives in Serbia were more extreme. We did provide assistance and worked with uh, Atpur during the you know, the period leading up uh, to the elections. But there, our mission was, uh, and our feeling was, that Milosevic had to go. Milosevic was a dictator who is guilty of war crimes. U.S. Ambassador Richard Miles was chief of mission in Yugoslavia until just before Milosevic was pushed from power. Miles is credited with having been a key player in the president's downfall. He was a supporter of Otpor. We stayed in touch with them. It's important to stay in touch, I think, with all sides in these uh, times of social change. How much contact did you have with Otpor in Serbia? Well, I often had the leaders of Otpor uh, in my house. Uh, I would go uh, to see them in their offices, and my more, more important, perhaps, my officers uh, would do that, stay in touch. Alexander Maric doesn't hesitate to tell us that his training and financing came from the United States. He still wears his Otpor t-shirt. What he learned from defeating Milosevic, he passed on to the youth of Ukraine. I work with um, a very brave people from, from Pora, and I try to share some of my uh, experience uh, with uh, young people from, from Ukraine. In this photo, you can see Alexander Maric along with Marko Markovic, the one who led the street theater in Kiev, together as coaches in the Crimea. Marko Markovic now lives in Ukraine, working for a Freedom House-funded project in Kiev. He comes from the former Yugoslavia, and he's a veteran of the Otpor Revolution. He believes the Ukrainians improved on the Serbian model. I think that the Ukrainian one was the best. Uh, the best organization, the best discipline, the best people on the revolution, no violence. Flashback to that coffee meeting last summer plotting the Orange Revolution. There's Marko Markovic and Alexander Maric. The young woman who said they're not going to let the election be stolen, that's Alina Inaye from Freedom House. Beside her is Chris Holzen from the International Republican Institute. He had it on good authority that Ukraine's ruling elite planned to steal the election. They already have the votes, the numbers. I mean, they're all going to be falsified. Changing that situation is exactly what these people set out to do. Days later, a relaxed Viktor Yushchenko met with Maric and Markovic. They warned him the election might be stolen. He politely listened, but according to his aides, he didn't regard the civil disobedience plan as viable or even necessary until he changed, literally. The face of Yushchenko after his political enemies poisoned him with dioxin. His aides say he finally realized only extraordinary means would defeat the government. It took me a long time to persuade the other leaders and Yushchenko personally. He just didn't believe that the regime would resort to such lawlessness. But after the poisoning attempt, he changed greatly, and he realized that those in power would stop at nothing, and it became easier to persuade him. We asked the team, do you really believe that this regime will allow Yushchenko to win? I challenged each of the leaders to stand up if they believed this. No one got up. So then I said, 
give us the go-ahead to prepare people for street action, and they voted in favor. Russia's President Vladimir Putin also moved into high gear to defeat Yushchenko. He put his best people on the job. Sergei Markov was one of them, a Russian spin doctor who knows how to win elections. He believes Russia had a right to intervene. The West, he says, went much further. United States and European countries spent billions of dollars for the preparing of this orange revolution. It happened not during half of the year. During, uh, it happened during exactly something approximately last uh, 10 years, and it's ruled not only governmental funds, but a lot of private funds too. Western funding agencies were the chief support for both the Serbian and the Ukrainian revolutions. Along with the training in civil disobedience, they also funded the exit polls and the monitors, which proved the elections were fraudulent. That was the trigger for the popular uprising. Uh, it's probably in the range of maybe a hundred million dollars over a two-year uh, uh, two period. Sergei Markov in uh, Moscow says billions. Europe, United States. I would say maybe hun hundreds of millions of dollars, yeah. Probably a couple hundred million dollars that were specifically spent on democracy efforts and so on. The European Union also contributed, as did private foundation grants from Europe and the U.S., paying for independent media and training in all sectors of society. They did the same in Serbia. The young revolutionaries say the money was for democratic movements, not Western plots. Marko Markovic. The most important thing is that they helped us. I, I will not think in a communist way, oh, we will, we will not take the other something from the others. Why not? Because if we, can, we, if we cannot do it by, by ourselves, we need the money. And we don't have this money in Ukraine or in Serbia. Why not? Why not to take this money to, the, to do the right thing? When we come back, the Op4 Manual for Revolution strikes again. Nestled in the beautiful Caucasus Mountains, the Republic of Georgia. Georgia broke from the Soviet Empire in 1991, and what followed was a decade of nothing but trouble. Civil war, crony capitalism, and completely corrupt government. Just over a year ago, Georgians decided they'd had enough, much inspired by the uprising in Serbia and borrowing heavily from Serbia's Otpor manual of protest. They staged their own revolution. November 2003, exactly a year before Ukraine's Orange Revolution, Georgians took to the streets, demanding an end to voter fraud and rigged elections. Young political upstart Mikhail Saakashvili marshaled the growing opposition. Saakashvili is a U.S. educated lawyer who worked in New York City. He came back to change his country. He concluded the only way was through a popular uprising, and he gambled that the authorities would not stand in the way. The main thing that this thing is possible, and if people get together, now nobody, nothing can stop them. And that's the lesson, and that's the essence of what's going on. That yeah, no matter how good you have, how good your army is, no matter how well paid the police is, if those policemen get home and their parents, their children, you know, their spouses tell them that they are on the wrong side, they will believe it. That happened in Georgia, that happened in Ukraine. Edward Shevardnadze was the man to beat. He'd been a leading reformer in Gorbachev's Politburo. Georgians elected him president in 1995 with great expectations. But under his leadership, Georgia fell into its worst years of crime, conflict and corruption. It went from one of the richest of the former Soviet republics to one of the poorest. At his home in Georgia's capital, Shevardnadze shares his bittersweet memories when he was the darling of Western leaders for helping to bring down the Iron Curtain with U.S. presidents for friends. Shevardnadze says he just didn't see the revolution coming. I didn't attach great importance to this movement. One day, 
I was told that young people were gathering outside Parliament, about 150 of them. Early one morning, I got up and drove over there. And for the first time in my life, people weren't listening to me. Mostly young people. They were screaming, resign, resign, resign. The few hundred protesters Shevard Nadze has seen soon grew to thousands and then hundreds of thousands. They were responding to reports on Georgia's independent TV networks that the official results for parliamentary elections were fraudulent. November 3rd, when uh, parts of official results were coming up, which were quite funny and outrageous for, for the people, we started gathering first on the Freedom Square, but then we moved... For university the, student uh, Georgi Kandalaki, the election results were only the last straw. He was already angry with the school system where students paid bribes for everything. He was ready for a fight. The people, thousands, stayed here around the clock for 24 hours, for about 20 days. And for a week we had continuous rain and cold, but we still stayed here. Unlike the young people of Ukraine, the Georgians had no tents, but they were no less determined or militant. And we had uh, some piles of polyethylene trying to cover ourselves, and then, you know, water would accumulate somewhere and just get poured on somebody, and I got really wet once, accidentally. Young people took to the streets, confronting the authorities and mocking the government. Edward Shevardnadze tried to ignore the gathering crowds outside and the civil disobedience. He continued business as usual. After all, he was still the president. He had the army and the law on his side. Georgi Kandalecki shows us where the protesters went on the fateful night when they finally brought down Shevardnadze's government. As I remember, the signal was given and we, people started coming up on the street. And this street here was completely full of troops. People looked into the, their eyes, basically. And they raised their hands to show that uh, we didn't have any weapons. And then they just walked in into this uh, inner yard, which is just uh, beyond this building, to give us away, the freeway. So they just let us go. I've never experienced such a such feeling of happiness. It wasn't quite so simple. They stormed the parliament, finally breaking some windows to get in. The military and the police stood by. Mikhail Saakashvili was in the lead and confronted Shevardnadze. As I was finishing my speech, suddenly the doors opened. And a large group of people burst in. This guy is still standing there, and as if nothing had happened, he's delivering his boring speech. I read it later and I knew it was boring at that moment. We weren't listening. And I like lost my patience and I shouted at him, resign, resign, because don't you see that there are hundreds of thousands standing outside? Don't you have any conscience? I mean conscience? Don't you understand that it's over? Uh, and he was saying something, why should I resign? But this was all about who would blink first. And certainly we weren't going to blink. I had never run away from a difficult situation, but here my own security force went to work. The guys just grabbed me by the arms and dragged me outside. At a certain moment when he was taken away and when these demonstrators came in uh, and when we basically took the building, we calmed everybody down, we told the speaker to conduct the meeting because she was a member of the opposition. I was very confident. It was not, not like some kind of coup. I was entering the building where, where I belonged because we won the election. So it wasn't like we were claiming what belonged to us. I declared a state of emergency. I'm the commander in chief. I can use the army, the tanks, military hardware, anything I want. But then in the car on the way home, I wondered what would happen. 
No doubt we would win, but there would be bloodshed. And what's the difference who would die? They were those on my side. Citizens of Georgia would die. Tbilisi would be a sea of blood. And so it was right in the car that I changed my mind and officially called off the state of emergency. I called my son and he asked, Dad, are you going to kill people, shed blood? No, I said. I've called everything off. I'm meeting with the opposition tomorrow. I'm resigning. Georgia's Rose Revolution didn't come from nowhere. Earlier efforts to organize such a force had failed until they found the right model, says Georgi Kandalecki. You know, we came across experiences of other countries, primarily Serbia, which inspired us greatly, and uh, gradually we started uh, becoming politically active. The students of Georgia developed a brand called Kamara, meaning enough. Having a brand is something they learned from the Serbs. So where did the idea of Kamara come from? Otpor. 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 Most uh, absolutely. Serbia's Otpor activists, Alexander Maric and Marko Markovic, are a kind of rent-a-revolution team. Just as they would later train Ukrainians, Maric went to Georgia with ideas for how to rally young people to bring down bad governments. The similarities are no coincidence. Even the Kamara flag is a deliberate ripoff from Otpor. Young people from, from Georgia call us and, and they say, oh, we want to, you know, work with you guys. We want that you share some, some of your um, experience with us. And so. so what did you tell them? Oh, actually, we tell them everything, <laughs> everything that, that that we know about, you know, ten years uh, of our uh, fight against Milosevic. The Edward Shevardnadze can't get over the feeling that he was the victim of a conspiracy hatched by foreigners. I felt this awful sensation inside me. This had never happened to me before, never. They had done some serious preparations and spent some serious money. Where did this money come from? You can find out the name of this person yourself, without me. The name he won't say is George Soros, the American multi-billionaire and currency speculator. Soros funds civil society projects throughout the world and generously in Georgia. His office said Soros was unavailable for an interview. Soros's pet projects were independent media, but he was not alone. Georgia has more than two dozen independent media agencies, most funded by foreign governments and foundations. They were boosting the kind of independent groups that could hardly have survived without this kind of U.S. and other assistance, that they paid for exit polls together with Soros. This was important because we had a kind of parallel counting of votes that basically invalidated the official results. And those groups in the end, and especially the media, were one of the main instruments in kind of raising the public mood. Richard Miles was also an important player Remember, he was the U.S. chief of mission in Belgrade just before Milosevic fell. He says it's only a coincidence that he was U.S. ambassador to Georgia during the Rose Revolution. Our total figures for assistance uh, to Georgia over the past 10 years is over a billion dollars, but exactly how much was spent on uh, democracy development, uh, civic institution building, that's hard to say. Washington helped to fund the alternative election results, but Miles says the revolution was only the final act of a long play. Setting the stage for the drama occurred uh, over the past few years uh, as a result of ours and other countries and international communities' efforts to kind of raise civic consciousness here in Georgia. Georgi Kandalaki not only got his rose revolution, but he joined forces with those who planned to spread it. Georgi went on to Ukraine this winter, flushed from his victory, where he joined other Georgians and Marko Markovic,
who came to help Ukraine's orange revolution. Well, as Lenin said, uh, yeah, revolution is organization, organization and organization. And this also applies to non-violent revolutions, which Mr. Lenin was not a big advocate of, but still. On December 26, Viktor Yushchenko won the presidency in a free and fair election. President Mikhail Saakashvili was the first world leader to go and congratulate him. So where on earth might the revolution go next? Just days before the election in Ukraine, the state military marched through the main square of Kiev, a square that later would be filled with tents. Russian President Vladimir Putin joined Ukraine's outgoing President Leonid Kuchma, along with Viktor Yanukovych, the man the Russians were anxious to coronate as the new leader. The parade was to commemorate the anniversary of Ukraine's liberation from the Nazis, only this was the wrong date. The true meaning was lost on no one. This was a show of force, a suggestion of what might happen if things didn't go according to the script. Putin's appearance was to remind Ukrainians that they belong in Moscow's sphere, not Europe's. The Russians were just taking care of their interests, says Sergei Markov. Russian economy extremely connected with uh, Ukrainian economy. And uh, to have no cooperation with the Ukrainian economy, meaning dropping uh, of the standard of living for the millions of Russians. You were really on the wrong side of history on this one. We failed. That's why everybody calls it we're, we're on the wrong uh, part of the history. If we win, uh, people call, oh, yeah, this guy is bad, but, you know, they're right. Viktor Yushchenko won the presidency against extraordinary opposition. State television said he was a fascist. Airport authorities refused to allow his plane to arrive for rallies. His car was nearly forced off the road at one point. Efforts to keep him out of the race were crowned by an attempt to kill him with poison. It's not clear how deeply Russia is implicated in any of the dirty campaigning. Though Moscow admits it spent hundreds of millions of dollars to influence the event. Western agencies spent just as much, but they say they supported only democracy, not a candidate. I relayed uh, the concern of Washington. U.S. Ambassador over, Richard uh, Miles believes that outside the, support was necessary uh, to bring about uh, change in day. Georgia as Mr. well. There's been a hell of a lot of criticism of the United States for its uh, alleged manipulation of these events, but uh, as far as I can see, these were this was part of a democratic process which the United States and its people uh, were greatly interested in for years, decade almost. But was the U.S. involvement here subversive? Well, it would depend. I hate to sound like um, Bill Clinton now, but it depends on your definition of subversive. Adrian Karatnitsky of Freedom House. It's only subversive to people who are themselves subverting the Constitution. Members of the ruling elite in Moscow claim the Orange Revolution may have been a popular movement but it was also a Western plot designed to isolate Russia. I think it's a great political mistake because this isolation of Russia could lead to the dramatic increase of nationalistic and revanchist political forces in Russia, which could be a real threat uh, to Russians and to Europeans and to Americans uh, too. There's genuine concern now in Moscow that the revolution might spread. Putin and his regime have already tried pretty hard to prevent an orange revolution in Russia by working so hard to prevent one in Ukraine. Christia Freeland is deputy editor of the Financial Times and an expert on the former Soviet Union. She says the old ruling elite in the region have just had a wake-up call. They had a system for running what they tend to call a managed democracy, um, that they had sort of a recipe. Um, and the election of Putin uh, was a very important step in creating that recipe and gave 
the Russian politicians, also in other states, real confidence that basically they could get anybody elected. What is tremendously important about Viktor Yushchenko's victory and about the Orange Revolution, which made that victory possible, is people have seen the limits of the effectiveness of that recipe. And they've seen that real civil society, real democratic choice is possible in the former Soviet space. Marko Markovic is ready for it. I think that this revolution showed to the whole world that this can happen anywhere, which means in Kazakhstan, which, mean in, which means in Belarus, even in Russia. The Otpor Manual and its blueprint for non-violent revolution is on the internet in several languages now. Many of the same young people, with help from the same foreign agencies, are traveling the post-Soviet region, greeting a receptive audience. If we talk about exchange of ideas between Serbians and Ukrainians, who've never met before, who sort of get in touch over the internet, how much more important must these exchanges be between Ukrainians and Russians, who've gone to university together, who've worked together, who've been colleagues for decades? A key element of success for the revolutionaries in Ukraine, Georgia, and Serbia is that the police never received orders to stop them or didn't act on those orders. In the end, the forces sided with the revolution. But would that happen in Russia? In the past, in Chechnya, for example, we've seen he has no aversion whatsoever to giving the order for people to die. If you had a Ukrainian-type scenario, in Russia, it's much easier to imagine Putin giving the order for the army to come out on the streets and shoot at protesters than it was for Kuchma to do that. And how likely is it that Russian soldiers or police would respond to that and actually do follow that order? Well, that's the really big question. When we come back, the hopes and dreams of a new generation of East Europeans Ukrainians suffer from too much history. Famine, war, Stalin's purges, the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. They've celebrated victory over despots only to have other despots take over. Ukrainians are veteran survivors. The Orange Revolution represents so much more than an election. It changed our perception of Ukrainians. We can't talk about them anymore as these sort of downtrodden, lumpen slavs. Uh, it's changed Ukrainians' perception of themselves. <laughs> A delegation of Kievites heads over to the tent village bearing orange roses. They're going to politely thank the activists and ask that they remove the tents. The village blocks traffic, and now it's time for ordinary life. The diehards who still live here oblige. They fold their tents and carry away the mementos. <laughs> the mission has been accomplished, not so much in getting Yushchenko elected, but in having mobilized a generation. People like Sveta Medvedeva. Now we know we can stand up for our views. From now on, everything depends on the people. If we don't like something, we come out and we speak out. That's how we get the results we're after. In Serbia, little has changed since the revolution. In recent elections, a large percentage of people voted for the old guard, even though some are in jail. Georgia's potholed streets and high unemployment haven't changed, though more people say they can make it home at night without paying police bribes. Will anything really change in Ukraine? A famous Ukrainian folk song. The tune sounds rather merry, but the words speak of betrayal and disappointment. 
There are themes that run through Ukrainian culture and history, a legacy of those who let you down, and as the song says, make you crazy. It doesn't dampen the mood of those who want to celebrate. No matter who paid for the revolution, no matter that Yushchenko might join the long list of leaders who let them down, this moment in history belongs to those in the square. Sveta, for a moment, savors the possibility of things to come. That's our show for this week. If you want to know more about this story or about CBC News correspondent, please check our website at cbc.ca slash correspondent. I'm Carol Off in Kiev. Thanks for watching and good night.